Welcome to the Masters in Motion podcast, where we empower Masters athletes to reach their full potential. Join us as we delve into the world of CrossFit and showcase the strength, resilience, and determination of Masters athletes, because we love this sport. I'm Jason Grubb. I'm here with Rick Stevenson. This is episode 19. Rick, how are you doing? How was your weekend? It was excellent. And yes, 19 and still going strong, right? Hard to believe. I can't, can't wait till we're on our like 900th episode and you know we're a couple of age groups up from here <laughs> no. i'm gonna have a lot more gray hair yeah all the grays um hopefully we'll retain the hair on top of our head uh but you know whatever happens mm, yeah. we'll ideally be just trucking along and and crushing the sport of crossfit healthy hopefully we'll be yeah. healthy now i had a, um, i had a real good weekend um i went down to uh just outside of columbus and trained with jason tomlinson uh, Brian Hopkins, a couple others, uh, at his, uh, uh, Jason's gym CrossFit uprising. It was a nice invite, uh, gentlemen that you see for competitions. This is what I told you earlier. I'll just uh, tell the story again. When you see these guys at competitions and you'd like to spend more time in a more relaxed setting and just throw down together. Um, it was the perfect opportunity to do that. It was beautiful weather down there. Um, nice and warm, heck of a lot warmer down just two hours down the road than it was up here. And, uh, just chance to hang out with good people and uh, have a lot of fun. So it, uh, made the suffering well worth it. I also got to suffer this weekend with others. Um, often I train solo, and uh, this past weekend I held a training camp uh, in Dallas, Texas, and there were six of us, six or seven of us, um, training Friday night and then all day Saturday. And these training camps aren't, aren't necessarily competitive training camps. It's just a chance to train together. I happen to be in town and I often get requests from people that, that want to train or, you know, hang out and I, I, my schedule gets really tough. So it's just an invitation. So come train with me on a, on a Friday night and on a Saturday. And basically they do what I do, uh, scaled appropriately, of course, uh, for their fitness levels. And man, it's nice to train with other people. Um, Saturday was a monster training session. So we trained, I think from some I know, 11 till one o'clock, we ate lunch, came back, uh, you know, a lot of dialogue, lots of questions and answers uh, the afternoon and then I think we trained from three till six uh, and you know, we're all just trucking along and then the last workout of the day was uh, Diane 21:59 deadlifts handstand push-ups after every round of handstand push-ups you had to do 30 GHD sit-ups which made Diane I think a little bit more fun Ooh, because wow. okay I could I could go unbroken on everything knowing that the ghd sit-ups would allow me to uh Come. allow my my hamstrings my posterior chain to re to chill out and, and recover a bit and my handstand pushes would recover a little bit so it, it allowed for that on the other hand the ghd sit-ups like the third round of 30 uh when it was all said and done was pretty spicy and it was oh. one of those where, like, can I go unbroken here? Can I? I don't want to. Really don't want to. But we're going for it. And when we finished that, uh, we all were pretty cooked and um, and done. So uh, fun weekend. And it was also just super fun to, for both of us to not be solo and to, and to be doing something kind mm -hmm. of new, something Absolutely. different um, with others. Uh, that's, I mean, the, the best part of this sport is when we get to train and hang out with other people and, like, and sell our souls with other people. Whatever, you know? It's great. Shared suffering. That's what Shared I, I suffering. can't tell you how many Many times that term came up over the weekend too <laughs> it's the best well we've got some uh updates and news uh, semifinals are done for the individuals and i don't know about you but for for me i watched the northeast i watched a lot of the northeast i had a lot of people i know there a lot of friends there i watched quite a bit of the west uh but not quite as much as the northeast just a bit of the west when it came to the to uh this third week i didn't watch quite as much i, I think i felt actually a little bit of fatigue which is just crazy because i mean really i could just sit down and watch all the events over and over and over again but i didn't have a ton that i uh watched this weekend but um yeah. oh, it was fun back. to watch we are back, yeah. It was yeah. fun to watch just a couple of those final events um, and see where everyone landed on this um, uh, after the semifinals are done. Uh, what did you pick up? What are some surprises, well, some thoughts that you... Yeah, I uh, I, I probably watched uh, maybe... Certainly, I watched a lot of the uh, of the Northeast, or of the, yeah, I guess you're calling East, semifinals East, um, a little less on the West. But then I watched a fair amount of Europe, um, trying not to look at the leaderboard, but I would go back and find the heats that I wanted to. I usually watched the last two heats of men and last two heats of women, uh, just because yep. of the names that were in there and who I was kind of following along. Uh, the I, I'm, a, I'm a big BKG fan. And so I was really, you know, tracking his performance along. And I think he took a 25th on, on the event 
two or test two with the uh the ruck bag and the uh, uh burpees over the over the box and that kind of was unsettling i'm like he was trying for his 10th straight invite to the games eventually got there right but lazar dugich really put on a show uh without a doubt um uh the let's see y- uh Yonikoski was his ninth trip in 10 years bkg was his 10th straight trip um uh, i think what was a little surprising I, the, the women's side, uh, not surprising was Annie making it back. Um, kind of knew she would, yep. she would be there. Um, Sarah Sigmund's daughter, maybe, maybe the body's just not ready yet or a little yeah. bit more, more time. I was, would have liked to have seen her punch her ticket because then it would have given her another couple of months to, um, to really get ready, um, yeah. and be there. Did, um, what was, what was interesting? I, oh, go ahead. Did you see the event? Uh, what was it event six where she got stuck on uh, on the uh, rope climb? Yeah. She, yes, yeah. Uh, but she hasn't had a history of uh, of rope climb issues. I don't think. I thought that was uh, that was Katrin in the past, but yeah, um, I could be wrong. Um, but it it almost feels like there's a changing of the guard in in Europe. But Annie's not ready to let the door close on her all the way. If yeah, I mean, uh, Gabby Magala and Laura Harvath are obviously going to be up at the up at the top there, but uh, Annie was not yet. She, like I'm not I'm not done yet, and especially with the turnover, you and I were were going back and forth this week on how many um, different women are not going to be at the games this year. We've talked about it each um, each time it's come up. It seems to be another big name or two every week that gets added to the list. But look out, here's Annie. She looks healthy and not uh, her career's not over by a long stretch. Yeah, I don't think there is a easy prediction on how the female field is going to shake up at the games. Wide it's not open, crystal clear. Yep. Yeah, wide open, and uh, they're, they're It's so interesting because you know, like, like we don't get to see how Annie goes up against Emma Lawson right now or Emma Carey or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. We don't get to see that, and but we know how they shake up against like Laura Horvath, which is Laura Horvath mm-hmm. is just crazy good. So yeah, it has me just thinking like, all right, um, I think we're in for a fun show in Madison, um, and I think. I, I, I think uh, you know these top ten scores were not separated by that much um, when it all comes down to it. So when when they're in Madison, there could be the f- it could come down to the final event, which makes for really fun watching experience. It's no fun to be an athlete where you're battling for tenth place, but I mean first place on the last of it's nice to like lock that stuff up but boy it makes it so much more fun and enjoyable as a spectator when the last event matters for first place, and we right. haven't seen that in Wait, a couple no. of years. No, and uh, I, I I do think we need to to uh, you you make these uh, predictions or you have these uh, hot takes after each of the semifinals. But what you have to remember is it is only six or seven tests, you know, to put together over over three days. And uh, w- when you look at the totality of the the work that's included in the games weekend, how how many extra days there are of competition, how many number of extra events there are, uh, that by the final day, and you still have three scored events, um, I think what you've mainly seen is the cream, that, that phrase to use, the cream rises to the top. Um, right. The ones that have the have been are the most prepared and just physically able to handle that type of volume. You know, 13, 14, 15 events is so much different than a semifinal or a uh, old regional style, uh, you know, layout. Of, the, the volume is just so much less. So some, uh, some, some of the younger ones, some of the newer names, especially on the men's side in Europe, names that came out of yeah. nowhere, that's great yeah. for a few days. But can you do this over 15 events, for example? I, right. I think that's where uh, you'll really see the names that we're familiar with uh, there in Madison. Well, speaking of predictions and the predictions of what the events or how many of the events are, uh, we'll just tease this that next week our primary topic will be a prediction of what we think the events will be for the games this year, um, how many events we think there will be, what we think they'll be testing based on what we've seen historically and what we've seen through the open quarterfinals, semifinals, um, and we're, we'll be speculating 1,000% because oh, absolutely. There's, it's, there's literally no true way to predict. But we just know we know the things that we've seen every year at the games. So we can we can make some assumptions based mm-hmm. on all of that data. But you have, yeah. uh, again, last week you went through some of the historical uh, CrossFit games 
information for Masters athletes or, or the history of the CrossFit Games for Masters going back to the beginning. And I think we stopped at 2014. Is that right? Uh, yeah, 20, oh boy, 2014, 2015, somewhere. I'm picking up with yeah. 2016. So there I, it is. You know, it, I, I think I, I wanted to grab that year uh, just because it was the last year in Carson uh for age groups and you know notable where uh you know we haven't been able to see here in madison um one of their events and this was a traditional uh age group week like you'll be experiencing this year a tuesday wednesday thursday type of schedule um their third event that year was uh, feel the berm b-e-r-m and it was uh, four rounds of the berm run and i think if you've watched enough of those games you remember that up and over the the berm at the end of the soccer stadium into 20 burpee box jumps. So uh, you you don't have something as creative as running upstairs and up over the berm and back down the stairs in Madison, unless they're going to do that to you in the, uh, in the Coliseum. Um, But then the final event, uh, they called it final for lack of um, imagination, Um, but it was opened up with 27 chest to bar and then into two rounds of uh, 12 deadlifts, nine hang power cleans and six jerks. So very DT like, but the, the fly in the ointment was the uh, axle bar that was used. And I think the weight for under 50 was uh, 185 for the men, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Uh, and and I just remember so many people by the end of the weekend losing their grip, doing a mixed grip, trying to mix grip clean it uh, on the power cleans. And then switching their hand around to, for the jerks, um, kind of a kind of a nasty event to, to finish with the axle bar. And if I'm not mistaken, you have not seen an axle bar in uh, age groups since. So something to think we about. Have there. Not. No, yep. uh, 2017 briefly. Hey, that's the year that they introduced uh, swimming to age groups. Um, kicked it off with run, swim, run. Uh, the other other one of note. I've I've done this one before. Uh, it's, it is certainly nasty. The good old bar fight, uh, which was 50 chest to bars, uh, 40 toes to bar and 30 clean and jerks. And the weight, um, at 35 to 49 was uh, 205, uh, at least for 45 to 49. And, uh, boy, did you see that got nasty <laughs> at the very end there, uh, given the, the work there. Uh, 2018, again, you swam. Uh, now this is your first year, uh, it was. but if I'm not Am I mistaken? You just swam only. It was a straight 500 meter swim, wasn't it? They Correct. didn't combine it, it with anything. Okay, nothing. It was um, just uh, get in the water and run through 100 yards of mud, and then swim 400 meters with a super high heart rate from the oh. 100 meter mud run. Oh, <laughs> it's not very deep. <laughs> yeah, they. Yeah, well, again, we'll say this for next week, but the whole swimming in the uh, lake there versus swimming in the pool. So we'll yeah. see. You know, every year except uh, 2019 in Madison, I think that they've had the age group swim. So correct. Um, pretty good, pretty high likelihood that you'll swim again. Um, we'll just see depending on the venue that is. And then the other event in 2018, which uh, I want to get your, your opinion on was the, uh, the chipper, uh, the handstand pushups, the deadlifts, the calories. It was at the first year for the C2 bike that was, uh, it was introduced. It was. And then the burpees was, over the bar. Oh, yep. It looks terrible. Funny thing Tell about me about how that. Many, how, many, how many burpees over the bar was it 30 or I 60? It, yeah, I think it was six. You ended with 60. I think you started yep. with 30 handstand pushups, 40 deadlifts, yep. 50 calories, yep. and 60 burpees over yep. the bar. Yep. So the. The funny thing was is that every single one of us got a no rep on the first deadlift and I think that I think the judges were instructed to give a no rep on the first deadlift to make sure that we all co- made did correct deadlifts. It was very peculiar, but we all we all got no rep on that first deadlift or at least everyone I talked to. Um but uh <laughs> 225 pound deadlifts. I mean, we really had to work our way through that. None of us really had experience on the C2 bike at that point. So it was kind of a first go at this C2 bike. Um, And then by the time we got to the burpee um bar facing burpees and, you know it's funny in the in the warm-up area we see guys just going ham on the burpees you know they're just going super fast and i remember thinking i'm gonna just pace this you know for the first uh 30 and then once i have 30 left i'm really gonna turn on the gas i'm gonna turn on the afterburner and i remember getting to 30 and thinking i got no afterburner oh shit um i can't move any faster right now oh. So it was a, the 60 bar facing burpees at the end of that was really, really, really tough. Uh, you had to move the bar every 10, thank God, so that you actually felt like you were actually making progress. But um, I'll tell you the, the event that year that 
stuck out to me the most was this uh, double under snatch workout. So mm -hmm. you opened up. It was it was uh, really a snatch ladder for masters athletes, but you had to do double unders in between. You start with fifty double unders, five snatches at one eighty five, fifty double unders, four snatches at two oh five, fifty double unders, three snatches at two twenty five, fifty double unders, two snatches at two forty five, and Whoa. at that was a, a real fast workout for some guys. Uh, there was a real big split. There was probably three or four guys that really just smashed that workout, got through it in probably five minutes. There was a ten minute time cap. And then there was another group, the rest of us, that got really bogged down at the 225. Um, by the way, that's the first time I hit a 225-pound snatch was in that workout. Uh, so I, uh, I did hit one, and I stepped out of the box, and that was a no rep. So technically oh. I hit two, but the first okay. one was a no rep. So I took a big step forward. What was I thinking? So I took myself way to the back of the box, did another rep, got 225 again, stood it up, got 225 a third time, technically, but stood it up. And then, uh, and then I ran out of time to do the actual third rep that would be a clean rep. But, um, but it was a really exciting workout. I was ecstatic that I snatched 225 for the first time ever. And uh, there were other guys, Jeb Simmons, um, Neil Maddox, um, oh, probably a few other guys. I don't know everyone's name that was there, but they got through the 245 pound bar with speed. So really some amazing athletes in the 40 to 44 year old age group that year. What I don't have is the uh, the weights in front of me. Uh, they lowered them to 45 to 49, I believe. Um, okay. I'm pretty sure. Again, those were, uh, you know, back, looking back, and um, I don't believe that event was uh, put out on YouTube on any of the games uh, games channel because that was er that was early on Correct. in the competition, right? Yeah. Usually each t each year we miss the first event yes. or two um, in the in years past. There. Uh, uh, and speaking of uh, footage, 2019, another year that uh, you were there. Uh, you and I were just saying how there was no coverage, so that's one that uh, I've looked at these have talked to a lot of a lot of guys that have been there but uh not having any uh viewing from it you know tell me uh what might stand out from you on um on 2019 that you remember besides yeah. the fact that you didn't have to swim <laughs> we did not have to swim uh, i was ready to swim i was practiced but we did not swim which we all thought felt was pretty peculiar um given that that we'd swam in the past uh, in Madison both times, but there was no swim. A couple of the workouts that stood out to me in 2019, um, the first one was a uh, 4K, 4K, 6K? 6K. Uh, I believe it was a uh, 6K. Ruck run. Yeah, uh, 6K. Ruck run. And we all, we, it was one of those events that we all did it. Uh, you know, the individuals did that same event. And so essentially you, you ran with a 20-pound ruck on your back for 1,500 meters. It was one big lap outside of the outdoor field around this park and then back in. And then every time you came back in, you had to add... 10 pounds so the first lap was 20 pounds second lap was 30 pounds third rep was uh, lap was 40 pounds and then the final lap was 50 pounds on your back and this destroyed people absolutely destroyed people i mean even on the uh even in the individual side there were a lot of athletes that would walk because their legs were cramping the ruck the heavier it got the more of a uh compromised position you were in on your run which made you much more quad dominant on your run because of just the way you carried that ruck on your back. And, you know, some people uh, like Haley Adams, for example, you know, they had uh, significant uh, rashes on their back. It just tore the skin right off. But a lot of athletes on the field had leg cramps and just found themselves not even able to walk, like just standing there. You just you just see a guy just stop, stop, dead stop like a oh. like a like a zombie. It was so strange. And uh, luckily, I was able to push myself through that one. I was battling with uh, Nuna Costa and Kane Hayes on that one. It was, you know, us three just battling and battling and battling. They would not stop. Uh, but I pulled off uh, what I thought was an event win. I came through the field. I was running down the field. I was so excited. Uh, but they, they sent off quite a few Masters athletes at the same time, maybe three or four age groups at the same time. So I thought that was my first event win until I found out that there was one guy in our age group who was uh, uh, part of the military, and he, you know, he ate ruck runs for lunch so mm -hmm. he was done and showered and back at the hotel before any of us finished wow. um, he beat all of the age groups i think i actually think what they sent us with the teenagers i think every male age group went uh at one time so that would be um that'd be seven eight nine age groups all went at one time um it was horrifying um that was also the year where they cut the lineup to 10 there were only 10 spots at the Correct. games for 10 us started in yep 10 finished yep. as long as there were 10 yep. healthy 
male and female. Uh, so and, you just uh, had a fewer number of uh, total athletes overall, but all, all men went together, including the teenagers. Yes. In terms, you keep the weights run. the same. Yeah. It, well, four o'clock on the first day. First day. Four o'clock in the afternoon on the first day. And I'll tell whoa. you. Uh, it was hot. hot, and it messed people up for the whole weekend. Uh, really did. Uh, what I was going to say, I know that was a uh, Dave Castro programmed year, and last year was a was a Boz um, programmed year. But there's that theme that's uh, uh, teased throughout, in where age groups will do something that is exactly the same as um, the individuals. And yeah, here's a case really where fun. it was a six k, same standards for for the uh, for the elite males and females. And whereas last year, you know, the swim and the ski event, really the same layout and everything across uh, across that. So um, that's something that it has happened a few times. In fact, I, th- I believe um, 2017 had the had the sprint O course. Um, yes, for, for both yep. for both age groups and uh, and elite. So th- that's something to look at. Maybe we'll even start to make some guesses next week. Um, wherever, whatever theme that Boz lands on for his, uh, his, his one event where he might like to have everybody do it since it's, you know, the infrastructure is going to be in place. If it calls for something like that, then it makes sense to run all athletes, uh, athletes through that at once. Precisely. Um, yep. 2020, no games, obviously with, uh, uh, for the age groups with COVID and that's where, uh, Legends uh, kind of picked up the slack, and uh, Masters Fitness Collective uh, began. Yep. Uh, but back to 2021, uh, you were a uh, earlier part of the week, I believe, right? Not, yes. Not yep. concurrent. Twenty and, of us. Uh, tw- tw- back to a field of 20, which has age groups, you know, kind of scratching their heads, saying, "Hey, guys, what is, what is it going to be? Are we 10 or are we 20?" Uh, but I think what tell me about the takeaway of uh, the uniqueness of doing double unders on turf because <laughs> that's true. A say, lot of people. A lot that's of the people. one. Um, boy, was that tough. You know, it's on paper that workout is all mine. It's it was uh, it was bar muscle ups, ski erg, and double unders. Three rounds. Super simple, uh, but it was 100 double unders per round on the turf. And I remember sitting sitting in the stands, which you do the night before, and they they go through the flow of every workout, the standards. They're very thorough. They're very meticulous about that. And of course, when hand gets raised, someone asks, "So, are, you know, are we doing double unders on the turf, or is there going to be a mat out there?" And he just says right in the mic, "No apologies, just on the turf." And then mic drop, game over. Oh. We'll see ya. Um, <laughs> and we're all just. Just looking at each other like, what? Are you serious? And so a lot of us wanted to try to go sneak onto the field to try double unders on the turf. And you can't. You can't just go out on the field whenever you want. So um, for most of us, the first attempt at a double under was on the field. And I had at the time a uh, RPM speed rope with an unglazed or un uh, with just a raw piece of metal whatever we want to call that, an uncoated right. yep. rope. Uncoated. And yep. that uncoated, if that touched a piece of, a blade of grass, a blade of this artificial turf, it stopped, dead stop. Um, so there was actually an advantage. There was an equipment advantage. If you had a plastic coated rope uh, and you were gonna, you would, you had an advantage, that rope would move if it touched the grass. And so a lot of us on the first few reps, we just couldn't get it going. And then you'd, you'd find yourself in a really big set. But you would trip not because you were tired or because you, you let your arms get too wide, your shoulders were too hot. You just had to jump high enough that that rope never touched the ground. You actually had to jump with your hands wider with the shorter rope to make sure it didn't touch the ground. It was really, really frustrating, very challenging. Uh, but it, it was I challenging say, for everyone. Yes. Blue, so. blue shoulders out more than 100 double unders oh. per round. Might no. have, might have been. The worst part was that this was televised, right? Or this was on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So you've Absolutely. got the cameraman and these masters athletes. We just look so inept. Like, yeah. how can we not do double unders? But there wasn't really an explanation, super clear, um, by the commentators about, hey guys, it's damn near impossible to do double unders on this turf. Let's just get real. This is yeah. really yeah. tough. <laughs> and honestly, it, I understand that they throw the the unknown uh, at us. But there has never been individual athletes in any capacity, in any way whatsoever, that have ever done double unders on the turf. I think, I think they just goofed up, and they're like, "Well, just make them do it." I yeah, think we don't have happened. another. Let's see, that was fields of twenty, so 
Yep. You know, we don't have another 20 or 40 of those uh, yeah. mat pads that they roll out there and place there. So guess what, folks? You're just all doing it, doing it on the turf. First one the other thing that was The other thing that was tricky was with, with 40 of us out on the field at a time, they had, a, for that workout, they had 20 men and 20 women all at the same time. Um, that's insane. I mean, that's absolute mm-hmm. insanity. In fact, uh, 2021 also had a swimming again, and they sent off 40 people in each heat into the water. And that is absolute pandemonium when you are in the water with 20, with 40 other people. 39 other people in each heat right um it gets really messy um you know the the women just they're behind the men i don't know they line up the men first and then the women they just jam straight through Mm -hmm. and push us out of the way and we're like that's fine y'all go ahead because yeah i'm not competing against you (laughs) we just don't want to drown we're just trying to survive on this swim um but yeah uh the double unders on that on that grass were very, uh, very tough. I'll tell you the other thing that was really fun is they did open up the first event for us at the games that year was a surprise four and a half mile run. Um, or for me, a four and a half mile sprint. Um, Mm. I ran the fastest mile and then the fastest two miles and then the fastest four and a half miles I've ever run in my life. Um, it was relentless. It was a battle, but I went into it knowing that event one was a run event two was deadlifts and rope climbs really fun event three was a one rep max snatch and i knew i was going to take a hit on the snatch that year so it was uh come hell or high water i was going to win that run and uh hell and high water arrived and up uh, and but I, I still if I recall uh it took you a couple of days to technically win that event correct it did it did yeah. there was a, a lot like the bike race in uh the, with the individuals yep. in 2022 there there was an italian uh competitor in 2021 he turned in on the we had to do f- uh five laps i believe he turned in on the fourth lap he beat everyone by two or three minutes and it took uh days and days for that to be corrected um it's very frustrating that crossfit couldn't figure that out uh and even his team his coaches were not contesting they were very clear. He made a mistake. There was a language barrier. He was confused um, because I, you know, I had passed him on the run. I'd lapped him. So was, yeah, whatever. It, it did work itself out. But I'm glad that you brought that up because that was a uh, that was a heck of a snafu right there. <laughs> well, when you're watching from from a distance uh, and the scoring doesn't get updated and it you know impacted Mike Kern and everybody below you. Everyone. I mean, it was uh, yep. the the points needed to shuffle. So just one more thing there. Uh, the other thing with 2021. Um, uh, that I was uh, going to bring up is how the themes of maybe what we've seen in the open get brought out later and uh, through through the year ending up in the games. And that was the year of the wall walk. Uh, so the final yes. event in 2021, just as we had opened the open with wall walks, uh, we fin- you finished your game season uh, with a uh, uh, couplet of wall walks and thrusters. Um, so again, those are some of the things that we can think about and talk about next week. You know, hey, wall facing handstand push ups or more mm-hmm. shuttle runs or so- something like that that uh, uh, was introduced to us this year in 2023. Will you see something like that? in um uh in madison uh when the events do get released so it'd be interesting we'll put our uh put our best guess hats on very much and i'll still i'll still take last year's event in the pool um for the swimming and the skiing any day over um, a 100 100 meter mud run into a um, swim and back into a uh, mud run to get out of the lake so i'm glad you Got to experience that. Well, I'll tell you, the uh, the, the swim in the pool was uh, my highlight of last year's games. I had so much fun in that event. There was a lot of nerves, uh, but I know you had done a lot of swimming in the pool. Mm-hmm. I had done a ton of swimming. Uh, you and I actually went in to that to that pool earlier that week when we found out that it was a, a pool swim and we went and practiced swimming in that water we practiced yep. diving in the water uh, I, had, I had so much fun with you working through that practicing um and I, while we were there we saw chris hinshaw working with uh oh who was he working with oh there was a couple of the individual athletes that's right yep would yep. jason hopper was, might have been it was uh, hopper yeah it was, it was hopper. A hopper yeah yep and uh and uh, I, I mean, I just, even though the uh the the lifeguard wouldn't give us the clue that she had seen uh, skiers. <laughs> no, nope. uh, I think we were able to kind of figure it out, but uh, yep. uh, yeah, we, we, you had an idea it was going to be some type of a machine by that point. Some but, type of machine. Yeah. It just made sense. And even logically, you know, we're not going to mm-hmm. 
get out and do kettlebell, kettlebell swings on the tile yeah, exactly. or something. No, um, no. But uh, man, I I loved that. I loved that workout. Uh, it was a ski erg workout as much as a swim workout. And the fact that we were all able to do that, they were able to run the entire gamut, adaptive athletes, every single athlete through that pool was mm-hmm. a really special experience. And for me, the highlight was that I, I won the pool event and that locked up my win for the games. I With that event, I cleared 100 points to go into the final event um, on autopilot. And that was, that. that's, it's just funny when, when you spend, or I spent so much time in a pool trying to figure out how to swim over the past four or five years and actually have that turn into something that, that had a big payoff, you know? Um, yeah. Very yeah. satisfying. It was clinching. Yeah, it really was. So um, and then also, I mean, just going back, like as soon as we found out there's a pool swim, you did the research to find out where we'd be swimming and then figured out that we could go for their open swim time. And we had like 30 minutes. We had no time in there. Um, That was and (laughs) it was packed out. But man, we got it. We we went into that pool ready to go. I'm I'm glad because it took a a little bit of the nerves. It still didn't take all of the nerves away, but it took some of the nerves away when um, you were kind of bust in in through the back door, got to warm up, lined up, did it, back out the back door onto the bus and right back to uh, (laughs) very little time uh, spent at the venue there. But um, yeah, I think looking back across all the years and now that we have the data from the very, very early years in in Madison, I mean, in uh, Carson, uh, there are there are themes that either, you know, we'll see something that was brought out in the open you'll see it reappear in the games you'll see similar events for the elites that you'll see for age groups and you'll see new implements um every now and then you'll get something that has not been used before although you you could make the argument that they're running out of implements but last year were the jerry cans and the husafel bag and there's always something that will be a surprise to you when you get to to madison so Looking forward to putting our heads together for the next week and uh, seeing what we come up with. Yeah, well, I think we should even ha- like try to come up with a new piece of equipment that has never been seen before, and sure. we'll just we'll just yeah. create something out of thin air. Um, so I think it'll be great. You- um, you know, rogues putting their head together with that. They sure are. I mean, they have a gift. Well, um, with the Masters history, thanks for doing all that research. It's really fun to see where we've come from uh, as Masters athletes at the games. You know, f- from you know early well, 2010s, 2009, 2010, um, all the way up to 2022, and. Now we're 2023 and, and excited to see what they're going to do with us in Madison. Um, so with that, we we had a, uh, a brainstorm earlier today about, you know, what would our primary topic be? Although we don't have to call this our primary topic. It's just we'd like to answer a question. And one of the questions mm-hmm. that I've been asked so many times, and I, I thought that I'd ask you to open it up, is, um, you know, how do you go as a master's athlete from a uh, from a one class a day guy or gal to a competitive athlete? Because it, we realize if you want to be really competitive in the sport of CrossFit, um, and you and you want to do that because it's just something you're passionate about, you can't just do one class a day and expect to be a, a competitive athlete. So you have to increase the volume. But uh, it's not easy to do that, and there's not really a, a clear formula out there. So, uh, Rick, when you tell tell me about your transition from uh, everyday guy to um, you know make it to the CrossFit Games in 2022. Um. Yeah, my early early forties, I I was uh, certainly had jumped into into training, uh, you know, as much as I could. I, I I found a lot of the movements challenging, but was willing to work on them. And then I think I got that sense that okay, I didn't have a lot of top end strength, but I could move my body in space pretty well. Um, so you know, outside of some regional competitions, uh, very local competitions, had some success there. And I think that the, the transition, as you asked, was a qualifier for uh, the 2017 Granite Games after I had just turned 45. Um, you know, as as we all joke about how much work and effort it takes to set up a camera and make sure you've read the rules and lay out your floor plan and all that. It was something that I took very seriously because it was the first time I had um, really attempted to qualify for something to me as large as what the Granite Games were. Um, and, you know, each each workout uh, was, was challenging, but it didn't stop me dead in my tracks. And that's where I thought like, okay, this is something that I can do at this level, um, you know, just scratching the surface, if you will. And I uh, was able to qualify. And that's when that summer turned into, oh boy, we need to do a little bit more if we're going to go to, for me, a, a much larger stage. 
traveling, um, traveling to a competition, how to, how to eat uh, before, during, and after, um, how to warm up, how to cool down, how to manage your time, all those things that go into uh, you're outside your comfort zone. You're not just showing up for a one-hour class. So that back in 2017, um, if, if for me, it was a big stage. It was right after, it was about a month after the games in 2017. So there were two games athletes in my age group. And of course they came rolling in with, um, uh, with a lot of their games gear on. And to me, that was an intimidating thing. I'll be honest. I didn't know anybody up there, but it turns out these two guys couldn't have been two nicer guys. And so to Ray and Nick, I do appreciate you guys being as, uh, as uh, friendly and as welcoming as you could to somebody who was staring, like looking like deer in the headlights. But, uh, I, uh, I I think I took seventh out of seventh out of sixteen in our field or something like that. So you know, not a podium, but it proved to myself that I could I could I could compete. So that's when the mindset flipped. Nice long talk with coach when you get back and say, okay, look, this is something I want to continue to do, uh, but I'm going to have to work a lot more at this this and this. And each year you just kind of keep chipping away at things, um, trying to stay healthy. You said it last week. If you yeah. can't stay healthy, what you're 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 taking five or six steps back, and that's uh, you know that I think that's one of the bigger keys. But to answer your question, I think that was my first transition where, uh, based on the qualifier, I was just able to make it work, and uh, found out that I, I could perform at a bigger stage in an uncomfortable position and uh, <laughs> have some success. Yeah. And now that now that you're you're on this side of all of that, what is what is a what does this training schedule look like for you? Uh, if I can get up in the morning, no. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Um, we, I'm on, still on the compete side uh, at our gym here at Black Flag Athletics, and uh, that involves uh, generally most most of the week our our double sessions. Um, our coach does a real nice job of of mixing in monostructural work, um, um, a lot of accessory work, uh, especially this time of year. And uh, that's the call that you always hear: is do not skip the accessories. Um, just a, a wide variance of work uh, between bar you know, bar work and gymnastics. Um, as I said, a lot of minor structural, a lot of odd objects at times. Uh, but those double sessions, uh, if both can be, uh, achieved, uh, you know, that takes up a bulk of the time, uh, you know, certainly encourage, uh, days to take rest. You have to listen to your body. Um, now I'm not, uh, gearing up for Madison like you are, uh, but also I'm training with a lot of younger folks too. So I, it's the I don't want to fall behind uh, type of mentality. So I'm trying to do exactly what they're doing uh, when I can. So that's yep. right now typically what that what that looks like for me. Yep. We know yep. what you're up to. Uh, yeah, I currently now I'm I'm in the um, two session a day typically. Uh, and um, some of it is uh, a straight up, you know, uh, lifting in the morning and then uh, lifting in met cons in the afternoon. Uh, today was monostructural in the morning with uh, a, a big monster session this afternoon. Uh, I, like I told you when we jumped on our call to start this, I am dead. I'm I'm 100 dead. And uh, you know, doing our podcast on the excitement and the energy of the fact that I love doing this podcast with you. Otherwise, I would be flat on my back on the ground, um, just exactly. laying here, just a dead man. Um, but I certainly didn't start this way. And games training is really about 120% of regular training, um, at least. So this is not a good example. When I'm training four to five hours a day, this is for a very short amount of time ramping up for the games. And then as soon as the games are done, I'm shifting gears to really decrease the volume on the cross fit side of things and let my body sort of heal up because I will develop over the next six to eight weeks. I'll develop some small aches and pains, and, um, avoiding injury, but there will be some irritations that start to develop because of the amount of volume uh, that is excessive um, for this season and then go perform at the games and dial everything's back. Uh, but when I was, when I was 38 started CrossFit, uh, I was a one class a day guy. I was going six days a week, eventually five days a week. Cause I got a little bit smarter. Um, but I, I definitely I found myself very interested in the fact that the owner of the gym, he was kind of a competitive athlete in his 50s, but he would after class, he would do another workout. And I was, of course, wanting to figure out how to do that. And he eventually invited me to do some extra workouts with him, uh, which I did. And I just thought, you know, I was really excited to be able to do that with him. Um, he was just the strongest person I had ever met. And so I, I just thought if I could do additional workouts, this is great. Uh, I get to hang out with Keith a little bit more and learn from him. Um, but I remember like the first day or first week or two of doing like even an additional amount of work beyond the actual class was just 
devastating. I was exhausted uh, from adding another 20 minutes of effort. Uh, but I think that's kind of how it goes. You, you start with um, start with that hour class and then you, you start by adding a little bit more after class. Um, it might be an extra lifting session. It might be uh, something, maybe weakness work. If you're trying to work on a, a muscle up or pull ups or double unders for me, it was uh, in my first year, I worked on double unders a lot after class because I, I had a hard time getting those together. But um, I think that's what that looks like. And then eventually, like you, you, you sort of you do a competition or you qualify for something um, and it lights that fire. OK, then you talk to your coach or or at, by that point, for me, I owned my own gym. So I was my coach. Um and I just decided to increase my volume. And uh, honestly, I did it the wrong way. I went um, and just found an online free program, uh, which at the time in 2016 was CompTrain. CompTrain would publish their individual programming online for free. No warm up, no instruction, just Metcon 1, Metcon 2, lifting, Metcon 3, more lifting. I mean, it, I don't know if that's what it was, but it was insane volume. And this would be something that like at the time, Matt Frazier or Katrin David's daughter would do. It was an overwhelming amount of volume. Uh, and I would just trudge my way through it thinking, I'm just going to crush this volume and I'll be the, I'll be super fit. After a couple, two years of doing that and not making it to the games, I actually ended up looking up to try to find a master's program or at least a scaled version of an individual program, which allowed me to be a little bit more meth- uh, methodical about what I was doing and not quite as much volume. And that's when it actually turned around. But I was still training two to three hours a day. So I, I think the recipe is starting with your session, adding on a little bit after that. Um, if you start to feel the momentum, your body is responding, you're adding a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Then eventually, if you can get to a place where you do two sessions, that's the sweet spot right there. Because I know for you and for me, I think we both enjoy creating a lifestyle around our work that allows us to do two sessions. Um, and we do one session and we have a, a, a quite a few hours in between sessions to allow, allow our bodies to refuel, recover. We've got to you know, like feed our family. So you got to do some work. Um, I do all that stuff too. And then to do a second yep. session um, and be able to give 100% to that second session as opposed to doing one giant mega session where your overall energy starts to fade as you work your way towards the end of that. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's what it looks like. It's like you said, the, the number one concern, the number one thing you have to watch out for as you start to increase the volume is not getting hurt. You don't want to take five steps back. Um, and with increased volume, you need to make sure that your nutrition is dialed in to fuel that amount of volume and your sleep is adequate to recover from that amount of volume. And if you can get an right. ice barrel and a sauna and, you know, Norma Tech pants and a massage gun and a weekly deep tissue massage <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, you know, if you could do all of yeah. those things, oh, that, that helps too. It would too. sure be but, easier. Um, yeah. I mean, I, we, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have all of that, but, um, uh, but think I would love a deep education. tissue massage every week. <laughs> oh, sorry, I love that too. But yeah, no, think about how educated, yeah. um, how educated uh, masters athletes are now than they were just five, six, seven years ago, and oh, uh, you, you know how much recovery actually plays into it. It's almost as important as what you're doing, you know, as far as training goes. Uh, because if you're not sleeping and your body requires it, you can say, "Oh, I can get by on five hours of sleep." Um, yeah, maybe you can for a couple of days, but I think nine out of ten people that's going to catch up to really fast, and then yeah. you see a deterioration in the quality of the work that you're trying to do and put in at the gym. So. Yep. You know, the recovery is something I think we've all learned over the years is and, and recovery comes in many forms. Yep. But that it sure has, does. But it's been a learning learning curve for everybody. Yeah. And like you said, you know, I, and I did I mentioned, you know, sort of tongue in cheek, uh, you know, cold plunges and, and saunas and, and massages and all those kinds of things. But they don't hold uh, anything compared to sleep. If you're not sleeping well, it doesn't matter. None of the other things even matter. Those are those are slight percentage improvers uh where sleep is like the big 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 piece and um i know that you know you're you're a, you're a dad you've got a family and sleep is um important to you but it's not always perfect i mean it's no. uh it's 10 30 your time 10 30 p.m your time and i think you're probably working out at 6 a.m tomorrow um, uh, i've got and, an early class <laughs> yep yeah <laughs> that's this is what we do. So there, there are times when we do what we need to do, um, and it ends up stealing from our sleep a little bit. But for the most part, we do our best to try to maximize that sleep. Agreed. 
So with that, Rick, let's jump in. I, I just realized it. Let's get you to bed, honestly. But before we do yeah. that, uh, <laughs> let's jump into our, our tips of the week. I normally have you go first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and share my quick tip. I've just got a tip. Please. I don't have a product recommendation. Um, but I see you just texted me your, your pick of the week, and uh, it is amazing. <laughs> so congratulations. Um, my tip of the week is um, if you are – using an iPhone when you work out to listen to a podcast or listen to music, okay? And you want to record yourself doing a Metcon or maybe a set of ring muscle-ups or a snatch. You just want to either have it to publish on social media or you want to uh, be able to review it afterwards. But you want the podcast to not stop while you're using the video app on your phone because that's what happens. Um, this is what you do. So you actually open the photos app. I mean, and just keep it on photos. And instead of taking a picture, hold the picture button and move it to the side, move it to the right. And it will start I've taking a video. This. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And now and then you the, can, the podcast keeps going yeah, and now you're keeps, recording okay. or music or music if yep. you're... or music, whatever yeah, you're listening other, to is not interrupted. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, it's pretty fantastic. And uh, you know, a guy, I'm a guy that captures a lot of uh, video and um, I'm listening to podcasts almost the entire time I'm working out. So real nice tip there. Open the Photos app on an iPhone. I don't know, Android guys, you're on your own. But uh, if you got an iPhone, <laughs> open the Photos app in Photos uh, or in the camera. Don't switch to video. Stay on the camera for a photo. Hold the button. Switch it to the side. And I'll tell you that oftentimes you'll accidentally click the button and you'll take a blank picture. That's fine. You can erase it later. I totally delete fine. it later. Yep. That, <laughs> All right, Rick. That works because for well, for those who don't know that, many times we've been, you know, you're doing some work and somebody else is on the music, but then suddenly it stops and you realize that they've gone to video and then the music starts again. And and you're like, mm, yes, okay, well, I need to go over there and teach him that. There aren't many times I'll teach anybody anything regarding technology. So let, we'll let that be a small win if I can help somebody out. You're welcome. Uh, yes. <laughs> and also... Uh, my picture I just said to you, I knew you'd get a kick out of it. We're two days in here uh, with the uh, zero water uh, filter. Uh, much needed here. Um, I we, we had had Brita forever and weren't very good about changing the filter. So I'm guilty as very guilty of that. Uh, but the 22 cup zero water, zero water, uh, I guess you'd call it, it's not a pitcher, but it's the uh, uh, the big, like the big apparatus that sits in the refrigerator. Yeah. yeah, it's a tank, and it's fantastic. It pours easily. Uh, so far, early initial uh, reaction has been very positive, uh, and it's amazing. You use that little filter tester, uh, and you do it with tap water, or I did it with the old Brita before we got rid of that. Uh, kind of makes you cringe. And then uh, the uh, the zero water shows up literally as uh, zero. I don't know. Is that parts per parts, parts per million, million or what? What is the? I haven't even done the research. Yeah. Parts per million. Okay. So shame on shame on an old Brita filter and shame on our local municipal tap water uh, because those numbers are much higher than zero. So thank you very much again, getting me to spend more money. You're welcome. And <laughs> you know, as a guy that I travel from state to state to state, and uh, I I just never know what kind of water I'm going to get out of an RV park or any municipality. Um, I it's it's really amazing, and it, the fact that it comes with the water tester, uh, and you can just check that water and love that. You know, honestly, you don't have to check it often, um, but you know, maybe once every two or three weeks, uh, as soon as it starts to show up with just something like 0. 0.006 parts per million it says to change the filter but you look at that tap and the tap is in the three four hundred three four five hundred parts Correct. per million so yep, absolutely yeah. it's even brita it's was in the upper what upper 100s and we hadn't oh, changed yeah. the brita filter in a little while so yep um, yep just shows you high quality it's, product it um, is as great long as, well, you could tell me as long as it doesn't leak because you see the way i have a position if it starts to <laughs> yeah. leak i'm not going to hear the end of this so i've uh, you know I'm in trouble I've, there it won't leak unless you break it i mean i've broken mine uh okay, so i'm on good. my second one but no. yeah you'll be clear well we're okay uh guys it's uh I, i'm gonna let rick get to bed he's got an early morning class and we just talked about the fact that he needs sleep and i need sleep too i'm just an hour behind so with that guys thank you for tuning in to the masters in motion podcast if you found this episode Episode helpful we'd be so grateful if you could take a moment to leave a five-star rating on apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app your support helps us reach more listeners and grow our masters community until next time get bolder not older see ya